So this is uh, Strange Flowers. It's my, my sixth book, um, my fifth novel. Um, there's a, a collection of short stories in there as well somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's kind of forgotten about really, to be honest. Often happens with short stories, they kind of get forgotten, unfortunately. But um, to be honest, I think they're a much trickier art form than novels because, as the great Mike McCormack often says, the novel offers a wonderful accommodation to, to, uh, to writers. You can, you can go very wrong in a novel and get away with it. But with a short story, you can't go too far wrong. I mean, with a poem, you can't go wrong at all, <laughs> as Norman knows. <laughs> um, but I've described Strange Flowers as being, as being my most personal book, and I suppose that's because um, even though I've set nearly all of my fiction in the same um, kind of fictional village in North Tipperary, which is based <laughs> fairly obviously on my own home village in Newtown, in my hometown of Nina, um, this townland of Macagawney is kind of an evocation of Palace Bank, where my father grew up, and the cottage that he grew up in. And even though the people that surround the story are, are completely fictional, um, I drew from that milieu from those people very closely. Um, and I, planned, I was planning the book for a while, um, and my father then died suddenly, and he kind of died in very um, shocking and upsetting circumstances. So I was kind of in a kind of um, a fugue of grief when I wrote the first draft. Um, and it was, I, I really feel gratitude towards the book because it allowed me to kind of push away my grief for a while while I got this draft together um, and it allowed me to spend my days thinking about the book itself and thinking about my father's home place and his life and the kind of man he was without thinking too much about him being gone and so it was lovely and it really did feel as though he was there with me as I, as I wrote which was a real gift to be honest um, and you know I'm, I'm a fairly spiritual person um, I'm not hugely observant as a Catholic, even though I always say that I am a Catholic and I'll never ever turn my back on my Christian faith, ever. And I'd never denigrate it. Um, but I really felt as though he was present sometimes as I wrote. Um, and the actual, the, 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 the intense job of writing the first draft in those first few months um, is a bit of a, a haze now. But I have a very clear memory of the very last day of writing the first draft, where I wrote the closing scene of this book. And the closing scene, I'm glad to say, wasn't very much edited. It, it, it appears in this published book as it was written that first time. And I had a very, very strong sense of his presence in the room. And a real, a real sense of him saying, good man, though, because you've got it just right. You know, that's bang on. <laughs> and so for the first time, I was really, because endings can be so hard. You know, the end of anything can be so tricky to try to resolve something, but not make it too resolved, you know, to kind of... Not to make it look as though there's too much artifice involved, you know, to make it seem natural is very tricky. And so I struggle a lot on endings, but this ending was written easily and fairly quickly. And I had that lovely sense of my dad saying, yeah, good man, good man, no, fair play. All the light left Penny Gladney's eyes when his daughter disappeared. All the gladness went from his heart. His days had always been so full of peace. Before Mal went, he peddled round the parish in the mornings with the post. And he herded and fathered in the afternoons on the farm where he was caretaker. And he walked the fences and checked the gaps and gates. And his wife, Kit, kept house in their small, tidy cottage. And she did the books for a few local business people. And his daughter, his only child, went to school and learnt her lessons. And they knelt every night before bed for the rosary, all three of them. And they had a radio and a dresser and a yard of hens and the green and yielding world around them in every direction. The Ara Mountains behind them, and beyond the brow of Tontina, the shallow valley that dipped across to the Silver Mines Mountains, which stretched away as far as the eye could see, to the ends of the earth it seemed on a bright day. And the main road, and the village below their house at the end of the lane, and the Shannon Callas soft and lush below the village, and the river running through the callas to the lake, glinting always on the low horizon, no matter what the light. But the world turned cold when Mal went, and what light was cast was dappled dark with shadow. She left no note behind, just made her bed, and packed her few things into her mother's old leather valise, and went through the door and across the yard without a sound. And she walked down the lane to the village, and she took the early bus to Nina and the train to Dublin, She'd withdrawn what bit of money she'd had in her post office savings account the week before. That was all they were able to find out. Frankie Welch, the bus driver, said she'd seemed happy enough 
and a short journey in along the Esker line. Quiet though, like always. She'd said hello to him getting on, and he'd said he thought it was going to be a fine day, and she'd agreed with him, and that was about it. It was only herself got on the, the bus in the village, Frankie said, and he'd been surprised to have to stop. He'd nearly driven past her, she was so small. The rest of the passengers that morning were the factory boys from Port Row. She'd sat at the front, just behind his shoulder, well away from the factory boys. But he couldn't see her in his mirror, and he didn't like to be turning around in his seat, he said, and he didn't like to be asking anyone their business. He'd wondered about the valise, all right, and the early hour of her journey, but that was the kind of wondering that a busman kept to himself, the unasked questions that filled his days. It went around the village quickly. No one really knew what to do or say. Still, Kate and Paddy were kept busy with visitors those first few days. People climbed the lane up from the main road in twos and trees and walked the fields down from Jamestown and Bunnacree to sympathise and speculate and reassure. Kindnesses were carried from distant hills and up from the lakeshore and laid at their door. Novenas were pledged and envelopes containing handwritten petitions to Christ and to various saints with clear instructions on timing and frequency of incantation were left on the countertop, propped against bottles or crockery, the way to be seen. Never known to fail was printed large on the outside of one of the envelopes, and Kit folded that one away into her apron, and she patted it now and then to be sure it was still there. Things were gone funny lately, people said over and over. The world was changing fast. Everything was gone to pot. All that new talk and people's hearts and heads being turned, and the way they dressed now, and the terrible music, and wars going on everywhere, Vietnam and the Middle East, and only up the road in the godforsaken north. Young people were being given terrible notions, and the world was a fearful place. People living together and having children before they were married at all, and married people roaring for divorces and birth control, whatever the hell that was, and every kind of carry-on you could think of, and plenty more you couldn't. But Mal had sense. She'd turn up as sure as God. She'd land back any day. And Paddy and Kit stayed composed through all the talk and the heavy silences, and they turned deaf ears to things that were whispered that they weren't meant to hear. And they were grateful to their neighbours for the help. Kit had a cousin married in Dublin, and she wrote to her to ask if Mal had called to her maybe. But the letter back was full of questions and sympathy and empty of any knowledge of Mal or her whereabouts. Mal had not been seen by anyone. Or if she had, she hadn't stood out. A plain girl from the country with a brown valise and simple clothes. What could be done? Nothing, it seemed. Prayers were promised and a mass was said. Or at least Mal's disappearance was alluded to by Father Coyne obliquely and embarrassedly, in a short homily invoking saints Antony and Jude, patrons of lost things and hopeless causes, and the small drama was absorbed quickly into the village's store of small dramas, another of those things to be remembered now and then, reminisced about, sighed over, mal gladly and where she could have gone, God only knew. Paddy carried on his morning rounds because there was nothing else to do but carry on. And he herded and foddered and counted the jackman's cattle and sheep in the afternoons and evenings. And he walked the fences of the farm and did his jobs the way he'd always done them. And he called each Friday to their home place for his envelope. And Ellen Jackman said, God bless you, Paddy, the way she'd always done. But with a deeper sincerity to it now. And people made the same old small talk as always. Though there was a funny air to it in the weeks just after the disappearance, of awkwardness and hesitation. What could anyone say but meaningless things they already knew the answer to? Things like, any sign? Any word from Mal? It wouldn't do to be sympathising too much, because that way, Paddy might think they were thinking what was only natural to think, that Mal Gladney was either pregnant or dead, and it was hard to know which one of those was worse. Kit Gladney felt betrayed by Christ. 
but she pushed away her crossness. She needed him now more than ever, and she needed his blessed mother as much, if not more, and so she did her best to stay on the right side of them. She walked the lane, down to the main road, through the village every evening, and turned for the long hill and the church of Mary Magdalene, proud and unsheltered at the top of it. And she knelt on the cold ground below each station of the cross, and she pleaded and promised and implored silently, her lips moving but no sound coming out. And she held her tears for the nights when she lay in bed, sleepless always, until the last hour before dawn, when she'd fall to a fitful sleep. And she dreamed that she was young again, and holding a child to her breast, and the child was looking up at her through eyes filled with love. She cursed herself for not knowing more of the world. For all she knew, this kind of thing was a regular occurrence. She'd heard stories, of course, of people going off out into the world and never being heard from again. But as a rule, when you excavated a little bit deeper, it would turn out that there'd been some quarrel over land or money or a house or some kind of inheritance. Or that the person who'd gone and left no trace had had a bit of a want in them or a history of trouble with their nerves. Kit didn't think that Mal had a want in her. And she had no reason to believe that her nerves would be at her. She'd always talked away and bowed her head to prayer and sung along when merriness broke out and laughed at all the carry-on and loud, gregarious talk of the people who called to their cottage from further up the fields on their way down to the road. And she'd always been gracious and graceful and demure, proper, unassuming, a good, good little girl. Kit wondered if something had gone wrong with Mal at the time of her birth, if some seed of trouble had been planted then that was flowering only now. She'd had her suspicions at the time, but all of her questions afterwards had been answered curtly with a threat of crossness. No one working on St. Bridget's lying in ward at the county hospital was going to tolerate being cross-examined by the wife of a labourer. She'd been a long time in her pangs at home before the midwife had cycled down from Glen Crew. And shortly after she arrived, she asked Paddy had he a car. And of course, that time they hadn't. But Paddy said he could easily borrow one. And she snapped at him to go do it so and stop standing over them with his two hands hanging. Paddy had gone off across the top field to the Jackmans to get a loan on their car. And the three of them had driven in as far as the county hospital and there was a doctor and a nurse there waiting, and Kit had suffered unearthly pain. And she'd looked in the crucified Christ's baleful, knowing eyes, and found in those moments no comfort even there. And Mal's first breath had been a long time in coming, and when at last she drew it, the cry that followed it had been low and weak, apologetic almost, as though she knew the trouble she'd caused, and was afraid now of making any more fuss. Now, Mrs Gladney, the midwife said, as she placed the still pink form against Kit's bared breast. There is her ladyship at last. Didn't she take her sweet time about it? Didn't she make us go to great rounds? And Mal was taken from her again, and Kit slipped away to darkness, and her torn perineum became infected, and she found herself lifted from the darkness, and out away from the county hospital, and standing at a garden gate, with her hand on the sun warm wood of the top rail of it. And she was about to push it open and walk forward onto a soft, grassy path through an avenue of trees. But a breeze was whispering in the trees, a sighing voice saying softly, Go back, go back, you have to mind your baby. And she walked drenched, and her wounds seared, and her vision was blurred. But she could make out Paddy at the far side of the small room, and his cap twisted in his hands, and his face white and her own mother with her beads gripped whitely in her hands and she was saying, God help us. Here she's back to us now, thanks be to God. But she didn't know if any of that was related to this new trouble. It didn't seem believable that a girl just out of her teenage years who'd made hardly a peep since she'd left the cradle would all at once go off, bold and bareheaded, without there being some root cause, some reason, good or bad. The neighbours and cousins who called had no help to give in that department. Some of their stories of disappearances started badly and ended worse. 
with bodies dredged from bogs, or found twined in rushes on muddy riverbanks, or submerged in ditches or locks of water. Why people saw fit to recount these things in her presence was beyond her. To help her brace herself, maybe. For the day, the sergeant and the priest would roll up the boreen with dread tidings. She was only a shout from sixty, and Petty was on the far side of it, and Mal had been their midlife miracle, their smile from God, and now she was gone, and they felt on their shoulders the terrible weight of all the things about the world they didn't know. There's a kind of, um, I suppose, there's something of departure, even though I wrote a novel called From Alone Quiet Sea, which has at its heart um, a Syrian asylum seeker called Farouk Galahad. It didn't seem to be as much of an issue, to be honest, as the black family seem in this book. Um, there's a family called the, uh, the Elmwoods from Matting Hill. Um, and the parents are Barney and Delilah, and they're kind of Jamaican counterparts to my Irish um, couple, Paddy and Kit Ledney, um, in that they're, they're kind of, they're, they're working class people, um, they're hard working people, they're faithful, observant people, um, and they're prayerful people just like Paddy and Kit, um, and their son, Alexander, marries Paddy and Kit's daughter, Mal. And that's not a spoiler, though, no, it happens fairly, fairly, fairly early in the book. But, you know, in this day and age, I suppose, the question of appropriation is going to rear its head no matter what. Um, it, unless you stick fairly rigidly to your own experience, to your own milieu, to your own, um, to your own, dare I say, race, to your own religion, to your own experience, you're going to be you're going to face, you know, the question of appropriation and whether or not you've done your right to write the story you're writing. But I always say, I mean, my story, I'm, I'm a 44-year-old um, heterosexual white Catholic from Tipperary who lives in Limerick, um, and I have a full-time job and I'm a part-time writer, and that's kind of it, you know. So my story is boring, you know. I, 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 I don't tend to tick any boxes when it comes to... Um, when it comes to you know being outside the norm or whatever, they accept you know what people see as being kind of the norm, um, even though that phrase is ridiculous. And so my, if I was to stick just to my own story, it'd be very boring. You know, I'd never get a publishing deal for any book I wrote. Um, nobody would be interested in hearing my story. And so I have to, like all fiction writers, like all storytellers, since the dawn of time, since we first chiselled symbols into stone, I have to imagine what it's like to be somebody else. I have to go outside my own experience. Otherwise I'd write a memoir and not a fiction that would be extremely boring. And so I didn't feel as though I was taking too much of a chance when I decided to write, um, you know, a black character or a Jamaican character in a book. Um, because, you know, I've been around the block a few times. I've travelled the world. Reluctantly now, I must say, mostly. I don't like travelling very much. But when I do actually get out there, I enjoy it. And I've met lots of people, and I've been alive to other people's stories, and I've listened to other people's stories. And I had a job for years where I worked with people who were new to this country, um, and I got a real sense of what it's like to be a complete outsider, um, and what it's like to be to try to assimilate, to try to fit in anywhere. And also, I have a fairly forensic knowledge of what <laughs> North Tipperary was like in the late 70s, early 80s. I have a dim memory of being there, because I was there, obviously, I was born there, but I know these people well. And actually, um, I was very surprised to hear recently a review on, on a radio of this book, and the reviewer said, oh, he's been way too soft on country people. He's been way too nice to them, to be honest. A fellow like Alexander would not have been able to settle in North Tipperary in the 70s. <laughs> and I was really shocked at this, like, you know, these are my people, my family, to be honest. These are people I love. I know exactly what would have happened. I know there would have been a few smart arses and a few you know, people with their hands up in their face, talking behind their hand. And of course, when Alexander goes to play Hurling, as he does, you know, he, he would have, it would be hard for him to avoid playing Hurling, to be honest. A fit young man of six foot three or four um, in North Tip would have been told, you've no choice, mate, you're playing Hurling and that's it. You know, and of course, certain choice phrases would have been used um, when he's on the pitch. But I know these people, and I know how much somebody as lovable and as loving as Alexander and as gentle would have been loved. I know how he would have been accepted. He would have been a hero. I mean, I remember myself um, being maybe nine or ten years old and standing up in the uh, playground in the Christian Brothers School in Nina and watching these two young fellas who um, had started in the secondary school walking up the avenue. And they were the sons of a doctor who was African. And we just thought these guys were like superheroes. 
we couldn't believe our eyes because they were probably, for most of us, the first black people we'd ever seen. And here they were striding in along the avenue of our school. And it never would have occurred to any of us in a million years to use any kind of derogatory phrase or language about those guys. It wouldn't have been in our vocabulary or in our experience or that of our parents, you know. So, I mean, I think, to be honest, I think rural learning very often gets a very bad rap from people who don't know rural learning, who don't know the sensibility and the gentleness that, that, that is pervasive in rural learning. I mean, if there's one thing I know that I know for a fact I can stand behind, it's how people think um, in places like North Tipperary, where I'm from, and how they approach the world, and how, you know, and how various things informed our worldview and how we thought about things. And of course, there's darkness there. Of course, there is. In every walk of life, in every place, there's darkness. And we, and I explore the darkness. It's not, it's not as though I'm painting kind of a, a rosy picture of, of rural Ireland or places I love. I never look back with rose into glasses. Anyone who looks back through my books will know that. You know, there's an awful lot of darkness there. I, I, I tend to confront the dark things about reality and about existence. Um, but I know for a fact that Alexander would have been treated the way he's treated in the book. I think I've been very fair in that. And that means a lot to me. It really means a lot to me because the character of, of, of Alexander became very real for me. And he's kind of a composite, again, like other characters I've had, of, of the, the good and gentle and stoic and strong men in my life who I've loved. Um, and then there's the, uh, there's the matriarch of the uh, Gladney family, Kit, who, to be honest, is kind of a composite of my, my grandmother and my mother. <laughs> and she has, this lovely, she has this lovely way. And that's why, you know, the, the fact that I had that kind of almost spiritual experience right in the last scene was very important to me because Kit is very spiritual. Um, she has almost a kind of pagan um, slant to her Christianity. And that's, I think, it's very real, I think, for people from rural Ireland, you know, if you've any kind of memory at all of, of, of the way things were. It's changing now, but there's definitely a, a kind of um, a sense that we overlaid Christianity on pagan rituals and we kept them. Um, and her belief is predicated on the fact that your spirit is eternal. And that's the very basic tenet of Christianity. It's, it's a very basic tenet of, of all religion. But for her, it's a very real thing. There's a real, it's, 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 it's real that she's sitting in her kitchen and she has her beads out and she's saying her rosary and the rosary kind of segues into an experience where her late husband is present in the room with her and she's having a conversation with him and it's very real for her and it's a thing she takes as given and I, I love that. Um, I really love that idea of somebody being very pragmatic and very practical and seeing life's necessities and vicissitudes, you know, clearly, but still being very alive to the idea of somebody who's gone from this plane, still being around somewhere, still being accessible, still being, you know, almost tangible. That's something that really gives me a kind of a, an energy when, I, when it comes to writing fiction, because it's so real for so many people. And for me as well, personally. Um, I suppose we all have our own philosophies and we all have our own ways of seeing the world um, and we all have our own way of, of surviving, to be honest. Um, and we all have things that we, that we hold fast to. And for me, that idea of, of people still being present that are gone from this physical world is, is, a, is, a, is very important.